Well, uh, we are on week four of 2 Timothy chapter four. If you remember, week one was Pastor Curtis telling us to be courageous, and then Pastor Brian, week two, took us on that discipleship ride, and then last week he talked about how the Word of God is foundational and good and something we need to build our life on and how discipleship comes from the Word of God. And so then today, we're going to go through 2 Timothy 4, and we're going to talk about the fine print, the fine print of discipleship. Because I think all of you that have been here the past three weeks or that have been around the Summit Church for a little while, when we say disciple making disciples, you say, I want that. I want, I want that to be true in my life. And my main point today is that discipleship comes with a cost. There's a cost. Discipleship comes with a cost. You heard Sarah talk about that, that it's hard. Discipleship comes with a cost. It's kind of like this. Now, my wife and I, we are YMCA Purist. I love the why. I wish the pool was open year round. But we are YMCA purists. I want to be in a sauna with an 85 year old man until the day I die, right? I mean, I want him to tell me that without him, I would be speaking German. So those are the conversations that I get into when I'm in sauna. And, uh, and then I just ask why, you know? And it's great to ask an 85 year old man why because they want to tell you that. So. I am in there. I'm a Y guy. I love it. You will never see me working out there. I would just be in, in sauna. And so it's an amazing time. But our friends live in this neighborhood that have an athletic club. And they were like, hey, there's a deal going on right now. Y'all should join our athletic club and not the Y. And so they sent us this flyer and they're like, here's all the things you get if you come here. Here's all the things you can do. All the amenities, all the activities, all the childcare, all the everything. We're like, man, this sounds good. Sounds great. Yes. Okay. That's, that sounds all." Awesome. It's like first year, half off, all of these things. But guess what was not on flyer? The price. You had to call or email in for the price. So I got a a Ashley, of course, to call in. And so she called in. That price is way more than the why. Like I wanted all the things, but I'm not willing to pay that price because of what I already have. And I believe there are those of us in here that want to be disciple making disciples. And today I want you to decide to do that, but I want you to clearly know what the price is. I don't want you to have to call in. I don't want to hide this from, from you. I want you to know what the cost of that is. Because I believe that each and every one of us in here, when we die, we want to leave something behind. All of us in here want to leave something behind to this world, to our kids, something. We want to leave something behind. And if I could just make a general statement here, I know there are many things, but I believe the majority of you would like to leave some kind of financial stability behind for your kids or for your grandkids or for your great grandkids. Even some of you have called that generational wealth, right? Like you want to leave them some kind of stability. You want them to start off further ahead than what you did. And so you work really hard. You save a lot. You invest a lot. You spend your life working, saving, investing so that you can have enough to make it to the end yourself and leave a little behind for those that are coming behind you. Those are good things. In fact, in our five identities of a disciple, worshiper, family member, servant, steward, and witness, we talk about being a steward of your time, talent, and treasure. We want you to do that. We want you to live financially stable. And so let's just do some math here, all right? Now, uh, disclaimer, I went to South Carolina public schools, all right? We just got electricity 10 years ago, and so um, this math might be a little off, so I don't think it is, though, because I've had a lot, lot of folks look at it with me. But let's just say the average, well, this is true, the average family in America has three kids, or actually two kids, two kids, but let's, let's say you're above average, right? You're an above average parent, you have three kids. So there's one of you, you have three kids. One times three is three. That's three kids now. When you die, you have made financially sta stable because you worked hard, you invested well, and you saved. Now then, let's just say you're hitting 100%, and those three have three kids each, and they're financially sta sta stable. And those three have three more. In the next generation, you have 27. Then the next generation is 81. Then the next generation is 243. And then the next, now let's say that's five generations there. You start with one, you go to three, nine, 27, 
81 to 43. That's five generations. Five generations, add them all up, it's 364. In five generations, because of how you saved and how you lived and how you worked and how you invested, 364 of your descendants are financially stable. I think I could say to you, great job, great job. Now let's say half of this room does, does this. And I went this way because this side of the room, I've seen y'all and you just don't look financially stable, all right? <laughs> this half of the room, it's about 750 of you. You do this. 364 times 750 is 273,000 people. That's a, over a quarter of a million. 273,000 people because you worked hard, saved a lot, invested well, are financially stable people. Some of you might get to the end of your life and say, man, that's a good life. Like, I've made it. Like, that's a good life. Let me tell you, though, what's a greater life than that? Let me tell you what you could do with your life that's greater than financial stability. Now, these two things are not at odds. They work together, but there's an order of priority. Let's say you wanted to live your life to be a disciple-making disciple. Now, the average lifespan of an American is 80 years. All right, let's just say you took half of your life, 40 years, half of your life, and you discipled five people. That's one person every eight years. One person every eight years. You took half of your life, 40 years, discipled five people. So that's one person, discipled five. Then those five, disciple five, 25. Then those five, disciple five, which is 125. Then those five, disciple five, which is 625. Then 625 disciples five, which is 3,125. In five generations, 3,125. Now add all the generations up and you get 3,906. 3,906 people because you chose to disciple, make disciples half of your life. You invested in five people. Those five invested in five, and in five, and in five, and in five generations. There's 300 or 3,906. Now, let's say this half of the room cares about a greater life, all right? And these people want to be financially stable, but you want to make disciple making disciples. Let's say this half of the room, 750 that you choose to do this for half your life, you will have made. 2,992,500 disciples in five generations. Five generations. You would have done, done this. That's a million more people than the total population right now of Wake County. Wake County is 1.19 million people. That is a million people more than that, over that. So if you choose to live your life disciple-making disciples, then you could impact close to 3 million people. If I showed you that today, you would say, sign me up, but let me make it a little more granular here. I'm a big history guy. It's my hobby. I love it. I want to learn more and more and more about, about, about it. Well, the Biltmore over in Asheville, which we all love and we all want to go to in all seasons because they make it so dream, dreamy and expensive. And so... That house, that castle, whatever it is, comes from the main guy, which is Cornelius Vanderbilt, who we know as the Commodore, because when he was like 16, he borrowed 100 bucks from his mom, bought a steamboat, and then turned that into a fleet, then invested in the railroad, and at the height of his wealth, he was 185 billion, billion with a B, 185 billion. It's been seven generations since him now. And did you know there's no trace of that wealth left? No, no trace. In fact, Google this. They're no longer considered plutocrats, which a plutocrat is just someone whose wealth comes from an inheritance. The money that his ancestors have, they have had to make on their own. Now, if you were to tell me what is enough for generational wealth, I would say 185 billion will do it, right? Like, that's, that's good. I think we're going to be all right. But in seven generations, there's no trace of it. Now, let me tell you about a guy named Mike Heron. This guy named Mike Heron decided to be a disciple-making disciple. He led this guy named Neil Gooch to Christ, discipled him. Who led this guy named Rupert Leary to Christ? Who discipled him? Who led this guy named Ben Ellsrode to Christ? Who discipled them? Who discipled this guy named 
John Muller, who then discipled this guy named Jonathan, who's a pastor at a church in Charlotte, discipled this guy named Justin. Justin, who's an elder at a church in Myrtle Beach, discipled this guy named Matt, who is living in Charleston as a high school coach and involved with FCA, who discipled this guy named Dominique, who discipled this guy named Ray, who discipled this guy named Sean, who discipled this guy named Ethan, who over the past three years has seen 30 plus guys come to Christ, who discipled this guy named Jordan, who every time we have baptisms here, somebody from his Bible study is getting saved. I can name you seven generations of my faith, but I can't tell you who my great granddad is. I can name you Mike, Neil, Roop, Ben, John, and all those guys I just named, but I can't tell you who my great granddad is on my mom's side. I have no idea. I don't even know what his last name is. And so when we think about what we spend our life for, do we want to preserve our way of life or do we want to proclaim the way to life? Because see, our lives are going to be spent either preserving what we have or proclaiming what we will inherit in the kingdom of God. So do you want to preserve or do you want to proclaim? I want to proclaim. I want to proclaim. I want to show up to heaven's gate one day and say, you better open it wide because I got more coming with me. That's what I want to be true about me. That's what I want to be true about you. That's what I want to be true about us. And look, disciple making disciple is not hard. Satan is lying to you right now. He is lying to you right now and telling you, I'm not prepared for that. I don't know how to do that. He has lied to the church and told the church that you are Timothy's in need of a Paul. When actuality, we need Paul's to disciple Timothy's. We need you to walk with God and lead others to do the same. That's all discipleship is. Write that down. Discipleship is walking with God and leading others to do the same. And you can do this because it is the power of the Holy Spirit, like Sarah said. It's walking with God and leading others to do the same. That's all discipleship is. Each and every one of us in here think, ah, I need a Paul. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I don't know how to do it. Um, Are you saved? Do you sin? Do you repent of sin? Do you try to love others as Christ loved you? Are you involved in the church? Great. Now continue to do that and lead others to do the same. That's discipleship. That's what you were doing, bringing others along with you as you grow in your relationship with Christ. This is what Paul is telling Timothy here. This is the end of Paul's life. These are the last recorded words that we have of the apostle Paul. And he is writing to his spiritual son, his boy, Timothy. And he is saying, Timothy, get this, get this right. Get these things right. Put these things in place. And I know what you think. Well, Timothy's the pastor of the church of Ephesus. Paul's talking to a pastor. He's really not talking to the church. No, no. He's talking to the church through Timothy because whatever Timothy possesses, he's going to pass on. It's the same reason all of you love Nick Cage and there's no reason for it. It's because our senior pastor adores him and talks about him all the time, right? But we know about that. We take on the characteristics of our pastor. And so what Paul is saying is, Timothy, model this in front of them so that it may be true about them. And it needs to be true about all of us. Disciple making discipleship is what God has called us to. And you can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so let's see the first cost. The first cost of disciple making disciples is and it's lonely. It is lonely. Let's read 2 Timothy verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 5 again. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Now, we talked last week about the word of God, right? In fact, you can go back up to 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or messenger of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Then we see Paul building on that here when he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Reprove there just means to correct, correct. Now, how many of y'all by a show of hands wake up every day saying, I hope somebody corrects me today. 
Like, I, I really hope someone, somebody, you know what I need today? A good rebuking. Like, that's what, that's what I need today. I hope it happens from my kids. I hope it happens at work. I hope it happens at the gym. And I really hope it happens in traffic. That's where I need to be rebuked the most is by other drivers. None of us do. None of us do. I do not want to be rebuked. I do not want to be corrected. I run from correction. Believe me, my wife will tell you that. I hit the screen door running out the house. None of us want to be corrected. Why? Because we don't want to be wrong because we have prideful, sinful hearts. Paul is telling Timothy here, preach the word, which in order to pass something on, you have to possess it, which is why in chapter three, he rooted Timothy in the word. He says, preach the word because the word is living and active. The word brings life. Preach the word, Timothy. Know the word in season and out. In season just means when good times are had. Out of season means when suffering is coming. Preach the word. Be able to apply the word of God to your life. This is where as Christians, we can miss this or miss growing in our relationship with God is we don't know the word of God enough to bring it to bear on our lives. We depend on podcast preachers. We depend on somebody else to chew and eat the meal for us and then, and then describe the meal to us, but we never experience it for ourselves. We need to know the word of God. We need to get the word of God in us. Let me ask everyone here this. What is the last verse you have memorized? What is the last verse you have memorized in, script, in, in scripture? Now, I'm asking that to myself. I'm asking that to myself. I'm gonna tell you something about what we're doing with my son as an indictment on me. John 15, we are trying to memorize with him on the way to school, right? He's got about verses one through 12 memorized. Guess who does not? Me, me. I have to pull it up on my phone, which is dangerous as I drive him to school. I'm not saying do that. I'm just saying, you know, I need to be able to check to make sure he's got it right because I don't have it in my heart. That's convicting. When I read this and I think about preach the word, how am I going to tell you to abide in the vine if I'm not doing it myself? That's John 15. How am I going to tell you to abide in God? How am I going to tell you to be in a relationship with him? How am I going to encourage my wife? How am I going to disciple others if the word is not in me? My son can quote verses one through 12. He just turned four. I'm 24 and I can't, and I can't do that to save my life. It's wild. So I'm saying that to myself. Be ready in season and out. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Verse three, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teacher to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off in a mess. Now, I know what you just thought as we read that again. You thought, "Mm mm-hmm, he's talking about 2024. That's it. I'm telling you, Paul was probably not talking about 2024. He was talking about every generation that came behind him. Every generation, because Paul knew the conditions of our heart. He knew the conditions of our heart reject truth. He knew that the conditions of our heart want nothing to do with the truth of God. We want the world to be true. And so our heart is bent towards the world, not towards the cross. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, correct, because there's going to be an itch that your church has, that people has, that you're not going to scratch, Timothy. They're going to reject you. Now, we all know this. If we've been in a relationship with God long enough and tried to live for him long enough, we've been rejected. How many times does someone need to correct you before you just avoid them? Not not a lot for me. How many times does someone need to tell you the truth when you want to believe a lie that you just begin to avoid them? We've experienced this. And if I were to ask by a show of hands, how many of y'all want Timothy's job? None of you would raise your hands. Why? Because every body is rejecting him. In fact, we can skip down to verse nine or verse 10. Paul says, I'll read verse nine too. Do your best to come to me soon for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Verse 16, he even says, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Walking with God can feel lonely but you are not alone. It can feel lonely, but you're not alone. God has promised never 
to leave you and never to forsake you. Look around in here. We have people around you that want to walk with God. It can feel lonely, but you're never alone. If you're alone in the Christian walk, I am telling you today that right now we have community that we want you to jump into. We have relationships that we want you to get in. We have Savior that we want you to serve with someone. Satan wants to isolate you. Satan wants you to think that you're alone because when we're alone, what do we do? Give up. Give up. We stop. We, we stop. We start prioritizing other things in our life. Disciple-making, discipleship can feel lonely because you can be rejected by those you love the most. Let me tell you a story about some of those boys, that, the names that I mentioned. I was on staff with a college ministry called Campus Outreach, and I would go to their dorm rooms at times when I knew they were there. And I would wait, stand outside the door, and these little punks would be in there playing FIFA, and they would be shouting, yelling, everything on the phone. I would beat on the door real loud to scare them, right? And then all of a sudden, you know what would happen? The TV would go on mute, and the lights would get turned off. I'm like, you know I just saw that, right? You know I can hear you, right? I'm standing right here. I will sit right here and wait for you. Then they come out like, oh man, we were asleep. Oh, man, I don't know. I'm like, stop it, stop it. Let me into your room and your life. And so there's going to be rejection. There's going to be hardships. You are going to feel alone because Satan in this world doesn't want, to make you, doesn't want you to make disciples of Christ. It doesn't want you to grow in your walk with Christ doesn't want you to know the truth of God and be able to apply it to your life and lead others to do the same. If you're feeling lonely today, I want to encourage you that you are not alone. Stay in there. Stay in the fight. It is worth it. Surround yourself. Get in the community with other believers and say, we're going to do this and we're going to do this together. That's why we have small groups here. That's why we have men's and women's here. That's why we have student ministry. In fact, right now, our high schoolers are on a retreat. And I've already heard of high schoolers coming to faith there in Christ, which is amazing that God is doing that. But that's why we want you in community. Satan wants to isolate you. God wants to be in a relationship with you. So what we do is we grow in our relationship with God and we lead others to do the same. The second cost is that it's hard. It's hard. It is hard. Let's just set that at the front. Disciple making discipleship is hard. Let's read verses six, seven, and eight. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. What Paul means there by drink offering is he's comparing it to the Old Testament sacrificial system where after they brought the offerings in, the offering was not considered complete until the whole drink offering was poured out on top of it. That meant the sacrifice was complete. What Paul is saying here is the sacrifice of my life is almost complete. We're already at the end. The last thing is happening. I am being poured out like a drink offering, but here are the things that were true of my life. Verse seven, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Three things that we see that it's hard is that you got to fight, you got to run, and you got to keep. These are all the same things referring to the same one. Now, I have never been in a fight. I have not. When you think, think about me, I want you to think about the jun jungle book. I'm, I'm more like Baloo right? Like I'm just here, bare necessities, like just wanting to float and uh, eat a prickly pear, all right? That's me. Um, I'm not Bagheera. I'm not trying to start anything. In fact, the only fights I've ever been into, I broke up. And so, but every time I would walk into a place in college, there's somebody that just wanted to challenge the big guy. So I learned that if I walk in anywhere, I sit down immediately because um, I don't want to be a threat to you. And I really don't want my face rearranged. So I would just love for us to be friends, right? I'm not a fighter. So I don't know what being in a fight is like. I've been to a hockey game. They look wild, right? Like whenever they throw things, I've seen fights. Fights. I've cheered on fights, fortunately, um, but I've never been in one. Um, I, I don't know what ac actually fist fighting is like. However, I've had to fight my flesh so hard. I've had to fight for holiness like you would not believe. And this fight, when we talk about this fight, it's a fight for faith. 
That's why at the end he says, fight, run, and keep the faith. This is a fight for faith. And this fight is for the rest of your life. And this fight starts within you to believe what God has said is true and to rightly apply it to your life. The fight starts in your mind. The fight starts because you are going to feel things. You were going to feel insecure. You were going to feel angered. You were going to feel hurt. You were going to feel mad. You were going to feel wrong. You were going to feel lost. You were going to feel pain. You were going to feel sadness. And when you feel those things, you have to be able to think rightly about them. And the way you think rightly about them is you take the word of God and put it in your heart and put it in your life and apply it to your life. The word of God is how you fight. The word of God is how you apply. Let me tell you this, and Elder here says this to me all the time, holiness matters. Holiness matters. Don't think that you can just compromise holiness in your life and live as a disciple making disciple. Don't think that you can just let a pet sin come into your life and think, well, that's okay. I'm not as bad as the other person. Jesus died for one sin, all sins. All sins are equal in the eyes of God and that sin will destroy you. Let me tell you what's true about sin. Sin is devastating and it's devastating completely. And it will devastate you and every relationship that you have. The battle for holiness starts in you. Your spirit and your flesh war against each other. One of my fa fa favorite church fathers is J.C. Ryle. He was the bishop in Li Liverpool. And he wrote a book on holiness. And what he says in there is that the life of a Christian is a life lived at war. It's a life at war. And he wasn't talking about being at war in unreached people places across the world, even though that's an application of it. He was talking about it being a, a life of war internally, daily putting sin to death, daily choosing to follow God and not follow your flesh. The fight, the fight for your faith happens inside of you before a fight for faith ever happens outside of you. You have to choose and you have to believe that the word of God is better than anything this world has to offer. Then we have to run the race, run the race. As you can tell, I'm not a runner at all. I'm a pear shaped guy and I'm good with that. And so I don't run, but when I do, I'm running from something or towards something. And I don't want to talk about anything during that. I am only focused on what I'm running towards. In our life, we are running towards the author and perfecter of our faith. We are running towards Jesus Christ. We are taking our sin and our flesh and worries and our doubts and our cares and our burdens to the cross every day. We are running to the cross every day, to the one, to, say, to the Savior. He's the only one that can do anything about, about it anyway. It is a run. We wake up and we run to the word. We wake up and we run to community. We wake up and we run to prayer. And we run and we run and we run. It is a life lived at war. It is a life lived in action. And then we keep the faith. Keep the faith. This is because everything in this world is trying to take it from you. Everything in this world, everything you see, everything you hear, everything this world markets is telling you Jesus is not Lord. You are. Jesus shouldn't get to tell you what to do with your life. You should get to decide that and he should be okay with, with it. Your faith was put into Jesus Christ because he died for you, lived the life that you could not live, and you trusted him to save you. And what you do now is you keep it. You guard it. The Greek of that means to guard it, to guard it, to set it behind you, and you defend it. I want you to think about in your life, if I were to look at the things that you fight for or fight against, the things you run towards or run from, or the things that you keep, the things that you guard, would it be your faith and your walk in Jesus Christ? Or would it be other things? Because we're all going to run towards something. We're all going to fight towards something. We're all going to keep something. Are you living to preserve your way of life and a way of life that you think you deserve? Or are you living to proclaim the way to life? What are you fighting for? What are you running towards him? What are you keeping in your life? If it's not a relationship with God and leading others to do the same, it will perish. It will end with you. It will not last. But your walk with God and leading others to do the same will last throughout eternity. The gospel multiplies. The gospel multiplies. And I want your life to multiply. So we see the cost. The cost is that you are, can feel lonely is that it's hard, 
But I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing greater in the world than making a disciple of Jesus Christ. Nothing will compare. Nothing will compare. Read verse 8 with me again. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, I know what Satan's trying to lie to you right now and tell you that you have to earn this. That the crown of righteousness, that if you don't fight hard enough, run fast enough, keep as hard as you can, then the crown of righteousness will not wait for you. Well, let's, let's put Satan in, in his place with the word of God. So turn with me to Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Verse, verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Here it is, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, which means comes from works, comes, what I, comes from what I can, can, can do, comes from the good that I've done. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. See, we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He has done what he says he did, and he is going to do what he says he's going to do. The crown of righteousness is not a result of your works. It is a seal of salvation that came to you through Jesus Christ. And so we see even in 2 Timothy 3, 6, 16, that all scripture is good for training in right, righteousness. That's the Christian life. We're training we're seeing God greater and greater as we grow. The righteousness is not from us because if it was, we wouldn't have had a chance. The righteousness is from Christ, his record, what he did, not what we do. And so when we read this, we fight because he fought for us. We run towards him because he ran towards us. We keep the faith because he keeps us in perfect peace who love him. See, the work of disciple making disciple is the work of Jesus Christ moving in your life. It's the work of the Holy Spirit growing you and building you more into the image of God. So I want you to write down these two things right, right now. How am I growing in my relationship with God? How am I growing in my relationship with God? And then how am I leading others to do the same? How am I leading others to do the same. Church, that's disciple making discipleship. It's growing in our relationship with God, looking ahead to that crown of righteousness that we will get and leading others to do the same. Think about that, that, that day. That day when we get before God, when we are poured out like a drink, offering our race, race is done, our fi fighting is done, and we get there. And we see the seal of our salvation, the crown of righteousness coming towards us. How are you going to feel in that day? Relieved, happy, overwhelmed, joy indescribable. You're gonna shout, your hands are going to be raised. Well, I want us to live in light of that day now. I don't want us to wait that day that's what Paul was saying here. What's laid up for me is that crown of righteousness and I have lived in light of that every day of my life. I have longed for that and looked for, forward to that and I've led others to do the same. All discipleship is, is growing in your walk with God and leading others to do the same. That, that's it. It can feel lonely, it can feel hard, but there's nothing that will compare to that. There's nothing that will compare to seeing someone saved in their life, coming from darkness to light, moving from death to life. Nothing that can compare to that. When Jesus Christ says, my record is yours, and God has given him to us. Like if you came here today wanting to know what it means to be saved, all it means to be saved is that you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Scripture says you will be saved. And discipleship is just telling others about who saved you. That's it. 
The most beautiful thing is God has placed each and every one of you around people that he wants you to do that with. You were already there. You just have to engage. You have to live with the gospel intentionality. And I will tell you this, a prayer that God will answer is if you say, God, give me someone to disciple. God will answer that prayer. You know why? Because it's what G Jesus told all of his disciples to do when he ascended into heaven. Go and make disciples. That's what we are called to do, church. That's what we are called to do. And if you don't know where to start, that's why I want you to come to Witness 101 tomorrow night. I want you to come. I want you to learn how to articulate your testimony, the story that God has given to you. And then I want you just to learn a simple tool of how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with anyone who needs to know him. That's a great place to start. That's a great first step. If you're like, John, I don't know what to do with people in my life. That's why we have ministries like small groups, men's and women's. And look, you heard about Easter from Chris at the front. Easter is coming. We have five services planned. And here's why. Because my prayer is that you would be so moved by the Holy Spirit to be disciple making disciples that you would go and begin to share the love of Jesus Christ with those around, around you. And guess what happens when you do that? People respond and get saved. So what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping is that we have 10,000 here that weekend of Easter. That's just less than 1% of the population in Wake County. But imagine if you lived with a disciple making disciple life and you paid the cost and you live not to preserve your way of life, but to proclaim the way to life. Imagine what God will do with that. And we stand before him and you come to the gates and God says, well done, my good and faithful sir, servant. Now enter in and you, you say, hold, hold up, open the gates wider because God through me, you reached many, many more that are gonna come behind me. I want to see this world change. If in, or, in order for God to change this world, you have to say, I'm willing to pay the cost. How are you growing in your walk with God? And how are you helping others to do the same? Let me pray for us. God, we pray that you would do this in our lives, that you would do this, that you would make this true about us. God, please, in Jesus' name, that you would make us disciple-making disciples. God, in Jesus' name, that you would grow us in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, you would just, through us, lead others to do the same. God, we pray and we ask that you would move by your spirit in us and through us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.